Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rob Riock. I work for Crowdnetic, based in London, and I'm responsible for global products and strategy. And we're going to have a slight change of pace here, step back from a lot of the detail that we've all benefited from over the last few hours, and take a look at the globe, and specifically the role of tra traditional financial institutions and the case for collaboration with marketplace lending. Earlier this morning, I was uh, flipping through television channels trying to find coverage of a significant global sporting event involving a game called rugby. <laughs> and uh, I chanced across one of those interesting weather programs that was talking about the El Nino storms that are all coming. Figure that Paul Gu would probably find the analysis interesting. And they kept coming up with this magic number of seven, seven years. And it got me thinking that, of course, financial innovation goes through seven-year cycles. It was 1994 that saw the first credit default swaps. 2001 was really the takeoff of synthetic CDOs. And as uh, Peter Leffler explained to me earlier, the word um, diversification came in, which I hadn't heard before. Seven years later, of course, we had a global financial crisis, and here we are seven years after that. And I think we'll look back at this year and realize this was a significant year in um, financial innovation, not least because this appears to be the year that genuine collaboration starts to happen between marketplace lending and traditional financial services. So allow me to share with you my thoughts on the subject. I'd like to go back a little bit and remind you uh, what traditional financial services do. Um, talk about how global the space that we're in is and then put that in context. Discuss the implications for the collaboration that I claim to be seeing and then finish on a few comments about whether this has any relevance towards systemic risk and some general comments on outlook. So we've all heard the story uh, that the banks of today, which at the simplest level, raise funds from a variety of sources and lend to homeowners and small companies, um, among others, are less levered, hold more capital against their balance sheet, and actually run by more risk-averse people, who, in Europe particularly, because of the bonus debacle, are paid lower bonuses and such high base salaries that they really don't need to take any risk because uh, they get paid enough already. Um, and that's created a change in culture, which means that the inclination to lend has actually been reduced. Those wonderful products that we all learnt about seven years ago have more or less gone. And whilst that may come uh, as good news, it did finance a decent chunk of the West's credit needs. And that financing uh, option has gone for now to be partly replaced by the return of securitization. Again, uh, a word that I think was wrongly blamed for the financial crisis, that there is a good side to securitization, and that is coming back, but it's coming back very slowly. Which leaves us, of course, with this potential funding gap, and we all get excited that that is going to be filled, and indeed is being filled, by marketplace lending. And it seems there's, there's more of a 10 going on here, because this is actually pretty well the 10th anniversary of Zopa kicking off in the UK, and they um, were followed shortly after by Prosper and Lending Club, and we all know the story. And significantly, five years ago, China started. And the data on China uh, today, of course, is very impressive. Now, a lot of you in this room, I'm sure, have your own geographic focus and haven't found the time to see what's going on. And apologies for those in this room who are not on this map. It's for illustrative purposes only, not meant to be comprehensive. But an area you might not have looked at is Southeast Asia where I happened to be last week, so I thought I'd tell you a bit about it. Uh, I'm told there there's a 300 billion credit gap across the region, and nearly half of small companies are unserved by banks. Now, dust off your high school geography and knowledge of maps, and ask, ask yourself which countries we're talking about here. Well, clearly India, that's a billion people, but Indonesia is a quarter of a billion, Philippines another 100 million, uh, Vietnam another 100 million. This is a lot of people who are uh, growing fast, and their role in the supply chain is more relevant than it was, and they're not being financed. Drill down one level further and take a look at Singapore, uh, an economy which uh, is relatively mature, 
And this graphic explains the problem there. You've got a banking sector, bottom left, the big gray blob, which services SMEs so long as they're of high enough quality to lend in the kind of 8% per annum range. And if you're not in that range, then there's a bunch of money lenders out there who lend to you in the 8% per month range. And you can see there's quite a big gap in the middle. And you'll also be relieved to hear uh, that a number of companies, uh, including one that is here today, uh, Muller Sense, have decided to fill that gap because SMEs make up a big chunk of the Singapore economy but don't get anything like the share of credit that they should. Now, this is a familiar story. You don't need me to tell you why we're all here, but it's interesting to note that an area of the world that we've all probably ignored for a bit because we've got our own turf to worry about is just around the corner. So I don't doubt that seven years from now, the significance of Southeast Asia's marketplace lending will dominate at least one discussion in today's events. Let's, however, put that in context. And of course, the graph that shows growth, and you've seen a lot of numbers today, and uh, the numbers vary a little bit, but they're all nicely upward sloping, show that last year was double the year before, and this year will probably be double again. Look at the data of um, a few uh, months ago, and you get a slightly different graph. Um, we managed to come up with numbers of 60 billion for China, and some say 30, some say 60. It's troubling that uh, we can't nail down such a big number, but by any measure, China's big, and actually, if you add together the numbers on the slide and round them, we're getting close to that magic 100 billion number for, for global marketplace lending. And that's all pretty exciting. Until you put it in context of global banks and GDP, and I don't know how well you can see the slide from back there, but those little small numbers at the bottom, the thin lines that you can't see, that's the share of marketplace lending against a US banking sector of $15 trillion, an extraordinary European banking sector of <laughs> $35 trillion, uh, and then Britain and China kind of also runs along the side there. And you can see that uh, Europe's problem is it's slightly overbanked given the size of its uh, GDP. If we then put those numbers in the context of SME and consumer lending, which is after all the space that we're mainly focusing on, they're still pretty small. Now that, to me, is good news because there's plenty of scope for growth. But if the numbers really are that small, and if by some measure they almost represent a rounding error, what's all the fuss about? Why are the banks talking about this so much? Well, I have been very fortunate and have spent the majority of the last six months talking to banks all around the world. And I must have met in excess of 50. And I've asked them this question, what do you think of marketplace lending? How does it fit into where you're going? Are you going to crush, compete, or collaborate? And the resounding response was collaborate. They see what we're all doing today as additive to their business and intend in some shape or other to collaborate. And the reasons stem from the following. The first of all, the cost advantage. You're all familiar with the Lending Club slide that circulated a year ago showing that they had a 425 basis point cost advantage over an equivalent bank, whatever that might be. And if you look anywhere in the world, the numbers are the same. Look at the net interest margin of banks in the world. And the graph here is showing US banks. And NIM has fallen from a peak of 5% down to 3 and a bit last year. But marketplace lending will always come inside that. Uh, the banks were never going to be able to compete on the difference between where they can borrow and where they can lend. What about data transparency? Again, another graph borrowed from Lending Club. You've all seen this. This is the scatter diagram of the returns of all outstanding loans. But people in the banking sector love this because they see this as data that they will never have access to, even within their own bank. And as you know, you can download this data and manipulate it and analyze it, and many do. And the fourth thing was this lovely story of how marketplace lending uses different data differently. And I'm not going to repeat the data story because we had a super session on that earlier from which I learned a lot. But you're all familiar with the slider story. The slider we all move to fill in how much we want to borrow, thinking it's there, there for our convenience only to discover it's actually there to analyze our behavior. And the CEO, or actually the ex-CEO of Zopa, told me 
that 10 years of analyzing slider behavior, they discover that those that move the slider around are thinking about how much they want to borrow. Those that slide it to one point or indeed to the maximum move on aren't. And there's a noticeable difference in default rates between the two. So as a tip to any of you, move the slider. <laughs> At the same time, cookies need to be turned on so they can see if we're perusing Vegas gambling sites late at night or buying self-help books from Amazon. This is all analyzing our behavior, and uh, there are so many other areas where that can be done. So the banks acknowledge that. And of course, even if they wanted to, they couldn't do that. Imagine the interview with the bank manager, and he or she asking you to hand over your laptop so that they could take a quick peek at your browsing history. That's clearly not going to happen. But it is happening in our industry, and until someone legislates against it, it should continue to happen because it's helping crack the data story. Even if you don't buy those four arguments, if I gave you a blank sheet of paper and asked you to design a banking sector, would it look like the one we have today? And most would probably say no. Banks provide a transformation service. They take your low-risk, liquid, short-dated deposit and transform it into a risky, long-dated, illiquid loan. And that's a useful service. And to deal with the uncertainties of that, they have to have capital. But the point I'm making here is that transformation service isn't always needed. There are many situations where the needs of an investor are exactly need met by the needs of a borrower. Why pump this through this transformation machine when you can lend direct? And it appears that if the data is correct, that message got through to the United States a long time ago, where to be clear, disintermediation started in the 1970s, where only 25% of the US economy is banked, whereas in Europe it's 75%, in Asia it's closer to 90, although I can't verify that. It's certainly going to be high. What about the costs of financial services? Well, Professor Benjamin Friedman from Harvard University produced an interesting research paper that looked at the cost-benefit analysis. And so in the 1950s, in this country, Financial services accounted for about 3% of salaries and generated about 7% of corporate profits. And I guess that sounds about right, a useful utility. By the 1980s, the salary bill had doubled, but the contribution to corporate profits was running at a third of the entire economy. Now, this is the machine that's meant to move money from where it is to where it's needed. And it had become a, 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 a self-perpetuating machine that generated an unacceptable uh, proportion of the US economy, which is why many have described it as being socially useless. That's perhaps a little unfair, but certainly it doesn't need to be as big as it is. And I think what we're witnessing right now is the dismantling of that unnecessary machine. And of course, we're all running around picking up the pieces, and there will be lots of them. To make matters worse, banks are subject to layers of non-complementary regulation that make it almost impossible for a bank to expand and contract with an economic cycle, which is what they should be doing. They also used to be a very effective contracyclical break. During times of economic downturn, a bank would have built up a loan loss reserve that would absorb the inevitable losses from the downturn. But because the bank had this accrual asset that absorbed the losses, we didn't know about it. And I would argue that was a good thing, because at least we felt some confidence in our banks. The crisis of the late 1990s persuaded everybody that we needed essentially a mark-to-market -market banking sector. We're not there yet, but we're still moving in that direction. So we've now decided that the contracyclical break is going to be a levered institution that's mark-to-market. -market. Well, that can't be healthy. So the banks no longer play that role of being this break on the system. They are now pro-cyclical, and therefore they mustn't be as big as they were. So what then would be the benefits of cooperation between banks and marketplace lending? Um, the first, of course, is that this is currently going on, that banks provide a line of liquidity to the sector already in varying degrees. But for any of you in this room who've built a marketplace lending site from scratch, you know the challenge of building the book in sync. Go out and raise too many funds, your investors get bored because you don't have enough assets, focus on origination, and there's no one to fund them, you're going to lose those clients. So to actually to partner with a bank and have at your disposal a line of credit isn't such a bad idea. For the banks, of course, this is a way of doing something that the banks can't easily do. 
We take it for granted in running our own investment portfolios that we can choose what we invest in. Banks actually can't. They follow this random walk of client needs. They have clients and they can predict those client needs, but they don't actually know when a client wants credit and for how much. As a result, credit portfolios never quite look the same as planned. As banks are discovering, investing via marketplace lending gives you that choice that they never had. Accepted, it doesn't bring with it the relationship benefits, but if you want a diversified portfolio and there's some holes in it, plugging those holes through marketplace lending may be beneficial. If that's a liquidity line to the sector, then that's a win-win for both parties. The second step in this cooperation is what's sometimes referred to as white labeling. Now, an interior designer will tell you that there are many shades of white, and they seem to start with something as simple as a referral. But moving away from that, the relationships that are being looked at today are where essentially a bank is partnering with an off-balance sheet vehicle, which happens to be a marketplace lending site. Now, banks are used to doing this. They've used securitization vehicles for years, so conceptually it's not too different. And whilst this industry for now only wants to lend, this again could be a win-win. If the bank can white label or partner with a peer-to-peer -peer site and push loans out as its balance sheet requires, this is good for the bank. They can manage their balance sheet in a more orderly fashion, but it's particularly good for the marketplace lending site because they're now getting supply that they weren't previously gaining. And as we know, much as we would like to see the banks change, they are still the favored source of origination in most places in the world. So the white labeling is happening as we speak. Something as simple as an announcement in a newspaper right through to ongoing collaboration. And even in China, one of the sites there already has APIs into a number of regional banks. And as those banks originate loans that for whatever reason they don't want on their balance sheet, those are being pushed down the pipe to the site which is funding them with non-bank money. So this is happening, and I think this is the area where we're going to see significant development starting right now. The third stage, and one which for now is conceptual, but I don't doubt will happen soon, involves banks using marketplace lending for managing credit risk. Now, the graphics at the bottom here describe the realities of a bank's credit book. It's not some smooth surface of risk. It's typically a bit bumpy, with spikes reflecting good relationships. Not necessarily bad ones, it's normally the good ones where the bank has excess risk. They take them on because they don't want to lose the customer. Historically, the spikes were taken away by the credit default swap market, which really only ever worked for large corporates and sovereigns. And to the extent there was a homogenous, diversified portfolio in the kind of foothills, that was picked up and taken away by securitization. Now, neither of those work very well for SME and consumer risk. So the next best we can do here is to offer marketplace lending as the solution for active credit portfolio management. There is no reason why a bank should not, at the end of each day, week, month, or quarter, review its portfolio, and to the extent the portfolio is the wrong shape, which it normally is, push loans down selective pipes to relationships that have already been negotiated, where there's an acceptance that they have an interest and ability to take that risk, the considerable uh, legal, regulatory, and other hurdles have been overcome, and essentially, securitization light is reborn in partnerships with marketplace lending. Now, I said this is only conceptual, but it's doable, and I think it would be welcomed by marketplace lending for the obvious reason that it's much needed supply. The banks want it because they have these bumpy portfolios. And done in, a, in an uncontrolled way, I think the regulators would buy it as well. And just as a reminder, we've heard a lot about partnerships today. Uh, I just dug out some of the more obvious ones that have been announced. I'm sure there are many more. This truly is a, a global phenomenon, and whether you're in New Zealand or, or here in the United States, the partnerships are being announced all the time. I was down in Washington um, a month or so ago and had an opportunity to spend some time with the IMF. And the question they were asking, because frankly they're not directly involved 
but very interested. The question they're asking was, is this a new source of systemic risk? And they pulled out that famous diagram shown at the bottom of this slide, produced uh, in 1989, I think, by someone at the Fed, which if you print, you need four bits of A1 paper to print it. It is a schematic of how the shadow banking sector worked. And if you get a good quality graphic and you zoom in, it is extraordinary, the level of detail. The problem is that that ugly machine financed about 50% of the West's credit needs. It was opaque, it was highly levered, it was very complex, and no one really knew how it worked. But it did have a role to play in financial services, uh, as it turned out a disastrous one. But the question is, are we rebuilding that? Now, I put together a deliberately more simple schematic, and don't bother to read the small print, because it's literally just me typing a few names in uh, to a graphics package to show that whilst we are becoming a more connected and therefore more complicated ecosystem, the relationships are nothing like the ones we saw under the old shadow banking. There is some leverage in our system, but it's minimal. And it's interesting, this discussion on leverage, because someone who should have known better at the IMF said to me, so is there leverage behind some of these consumer and SME portfolios? I said, yeah. Do we think it's a good thing? I said, well, most of the world's consumer and SME portfolios are owned by levered institutions, pools, banks. And it was as if the IMF hadn't quite realized that for now we entrust sizable loan portfolios with institutions of very varying leverage. Europe is still way more levered than this country. And yet, as soon as we move those SMEs and consumer loans into a vehicle which has a line of credit, quite a conservative line of credit which provides leverage, everybody gets concerned. And I think that concern means that we as an industry should find some way of reporting the extent there is leverage. But just because there is leverage doesn't mean it's a bad thing. The question has been asked of the effects of interest rate normalization or a change in the credit cycle. For what it's worth, I think that that will result in two things. Firstly, the high yield market will reprice. When it reprices to yields of the 8 to 12% range, it'll come back into the sweet spot currently occupied market by marketplace lending, and some of the institutional money will move back into high yield. At the same time, an increase in uh, interest rates will produce some defaults, and I'm sure that results in some platforms re reporting higher default rates. But that's okay. That happens in every corner of the financial sector. I think it'll result in a rebalancing of what is currently quite a skewed market. There is too much institutional money waiting in the wings right now and not enough origination. If that uh, mis-imbalance is rebalanced by an interest rate, a change in interest rate environment, that's probably a good thing. So my view is that the systemic implications are small for the reasons I've just described and frankly due to the fact that all the transactions we're talking about are small in size and the market itself for now is also small. But let's keep an eye on this because we all get excited about a market that's doubling or increasing at a higher factor every year, at some point we need to start reassuring people that we are not building a systemically risky, risky sector. So this has all come about by a confluence of financial and economic events with the very crucial glue of significant developments in financial technology. And I think growth in China is due to a very similar perfect storm. And I think the numbers we see today uh, will grow very rapidly, not least because there are still very few regulatory obstacles. And I think people are beginning to realize that this is more than just a better way of doing something. Based on my 50 or so conversations over the last six months, I think the banks are unlikely to stand back and watch. They recognize that increasingly they're being contained by quite a sophisticated investor base out there. But I think they see that the opportunities of collaboration are compelling. I think we can expect more innovation. I think we can expect some consolidation. It is interesting that particularly in the SME financing space, the industry has so far contained itself within verticals. Do you want invoice discounting, secured lending, asset backed lending? And over time, I think that SMEs may demand that those services are perhaps provided by just one institution rather than three, because most SMEs, when they first need financing, don't actually know what they want, and they need some help in deciding on the correct form of finance, and if all that comes from the same shop, that must be a good thing. 
Over time, this will therefore produce an industry that looks and smells a lot like banks, but clearly will not be banks. And I think the most important point that's coming out of the growth of our sector right now is that there genuinely is a multiplier effect here. We're not just moving debt from one pile to another. This is actually enabling people or small companies who previously couldn't borrow to borrow. And the evidence is compelling that for every dollar being borrowed, there is a multiple, maybe three dollars of benefit to the economy. And as long as we can continue to show that that's the case, we'll get political attention, we'll get regulatory attention, and I think the obstacles to growth will be minimal. That's all I have to say formally. Uh, we're kind of back on time, but perhaps time for a couple of questions. Do we have time? Well, let's clap for you. Oh, okay. Any questions from the floor? Yep. Uh, there's no asset liability m mismatch, which banks have intrinsically. And what was the first bit? Sorry. Um, it seems to be a key point, a benefit of marketplace lending vis-a-vis -vis traditional banking yes. is the lack of an asset liability mismatch. You've got your source of capital matching the maturity of the, bar of the loan. You, you're right, which is why when I talked perhaps too glibly about banks providing a transformation service, um, I think we will need to always have an institution, be it a bank or some other institution, that provide that transformation service because you can't always match your assets to your liabilities. But you're right, the industry, in most cases, does just what you said. If you go and look, though, at Ratesetter in the UK and look at the investor side on their website, you'll see that the shortest maturity asset they offer is one month. It's a one-month product. Put your money in today, get it back in a month. Sounds pretty good. Go to the borrowing side, and the shortest maturity loan is six months. So how does that work? Where does your one-month money go? Assuming it goes into a six-month or longer loan, how do you get your money back in one month's time? Well, we all know that relying on new money coming in is a strategy that doesn't normally end well. So they, they must have some system that's kept the FCA happy to convince them that they can deal with exactly the issue you just raised. They are currently running some kind of asset liability mismatch. I'm guessing it's small, but the fact it's there means perhaps we're witnessing the beginning of a change. Where to cater to investor needs, we need a shorter maturity product, but in practice offering a one month loan is never gonna fly, so you need a six month loan. So I, I, I think you're right, I think 99% of the industry is match funded, but you know, Ratesetter is not a small player, and yet they're offering already a product that suggests some sort of asset liability mismatch. Yes. Do you? Yep. That was a long oh, that was a long answer. <laughs> I think we're done. Quick, quick. Okay, real quick. Sorry. Do you think there's a, a um, the the quality of the uh, loan is uh, is holding back certain bank qualified lending? Uh, there are some restrictions on regional banks that they can't take on these kind of loans. Is there a is that a, a limit to, to their ability to to do marketplace lending? Yeah, there's no doubt that people's criteria often don't match. Um, and that one of the things we're trying to do in Crownetic is create decisioning tools that match off people who have criteria with those who have assets that meet those criteria. But that is certainly one of the obstacles. But that's, this is a long question, so if we could pick that up in the coffee break, I, I want to keep Luan on time. Thank you for the question. Thank you all very much. Thank you.